Um, hi everyone, um, and everyone on the on the Zoom, as well as uh, everyone in this room. Uh, it's nice to gather on this uh, sunny but kind of cold Friday. I'd like to welcome you all to the first event of our of the Social Justice Center's uh, Graduate Fellow Lunchtime Seminar Series. So, uh, as you might be aware, we have five. Um, graduate fellows this year, the academic year 2021-2022. And as a part of our efforts to both showcase the research of our fellows, but also uh, to facilitate discussion across uh, the campus, not only within uh, the Social Justice Center, but across the campus around this, this research and to support and to provide the support and, and you know, um, critical engagement that our fellows very much need, uh, we are organizing the seminar series. After discussion with our fellows, we thought the best format for it would be to have consecutive seminars every Friday. So we're starting, we're kind of uh, starting it off today. And unfortunately, we're not gonna have one next week, but for the following four weeks after next week, we're going to have a seminar every Friday at noon. So we're and we're planning for for them to be around an hour and a half. But before I give the floor to Gustavo uh, and actually to to Cristiano to introduce Gustavo and uh, Manuel Rosalto who, who's joining us, uh, I would like to um, acknowledge that our activities and our this event is taking part. Um, is is happening on the unceded lands of the Kanyangahawa Nation. And our mandate is to encourage and support social justice research. So we are committed to encouraging people to learn about indigenous issues, to support indigenous struggles for self-determination and the protection of nature, and to actively resist colonialism and neocolonialism. So we're not only acknowledging the territory that we're on, but we're also actively asking and encouraging you to join efforts and struggles to counter colonialism and neocolonialism. So I will just give the floor to Christian. Thank you again all for joining us. And I hope uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a great, great event. Thank you, Bengi. So Gustavo, uh, I'm not sure I will say your name right. I should have yeah. done that before. Gustavo Enrique de Andrade is a master's student in political science at Concordia. He also holds a BA in public administration and his work focuses on informal uh, work with an emphasis on resistance in Latin America. And he's also coordinator of the HELAM, yeah. so yes. So the Réseau d'études latino américaine de Montréal. Uh, and after uh, we will have a commentary by Professor Manuel Rosaldo. His research focuses on the potentials and constraints for labor rights organizing among precarious and formal workers who have historically been excluded from both labor rights legislation and labor unions. And he recently completed a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, where his dissertation analyzed waste pickers' struggles to win state recognition and remuneration for their labor in Brazil and Colombia. And Manuel's broader research and teaching interests include labor development, social movement, state society relations, and of course, Latin American politics. His most recent, recent paper is dealing with the exclusion of street waste pickers from inclusive recycling in Sao Paulo. And it was just published and I read, that, uh, I read it yesterday and it's really great. So maybe I can share it around if you want to have a look at it. So uh, I'll leave you, uh, to it, uh, Gustavo, for your talk. And I think you can remove your mask. We are quite, we, we are respecting the social distance. Uh, yeah. Okay. Would you like me to grab water or something for you, or you're okay? No, I'm okay. 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 Hello, everyone. Uh, Thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Bengi. Thank you, Christian, uh, for inviting me for this presentation. Thank you, Professor Rosaldo, for accepting our invitation to comment on my research. It's a very 
honor uh, to have you here because like you are one of my main sources. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So I'll be talking about cooperatives as tools of uh, resistance uh, of catadores in São Paulo, Brazil. Uh, my main puzzle is how we speakers resist to both chronic and structural violence uh, in their workplace and why being a bottom-up uh, cooperative is so important for them and impact their strategies of resistance. And why is this important? Um, we know that like, recycling is becoming like, crucial to the sustainability of the world. So we need to have more and more recycling. Um, we are getting out of raw materials. They are getting extremely costly to extract. So this is a, 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 a huge industry that uh, it's expected to, to grow a lot. And in the global south, the main actor in this uh, sector are the waste pickers, catadores. I will use waste pickers and catadores inter interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Um, so for example, just one small example, Brazil is today the top uh, recycle, uh, the top country that recycles aluminum. We recycled more than 95% of the aluminum that we produce. And like almost all of this aluminum that is recycled comes from waste pickers picking cans and, and small aluminum objects on waste and on streets. And but even though they are this like, crucial actor, there's tr they're still extremely extremely marginalized and in a precarious social, social and economic uh, position. Before you go to this slide, okay. could you just because I don't have the mouse in my hand, can you just close uh, use the second maybe the second so it can still see you? This one, yeah. Uh, pin yourself. This would be perfect. Yeah, because we will be able to see your. Uh, cool. Hi. Welcome. And my argument, based on uh, Osaldo's uh, and Miller's work, Miller uh, published a book on 2018 about. Uh, uh, working on dumps in Rio de Janeiro. She went there and worked with uh, waste pickers for a year, collecting with them. So she has a very interesting uh, perspective of waste picking through the waste pickers' lenses. And Rosaldo also made a terrific work on uh, ethnographical work uh, on Sao Paulo, working with waste pickers on. on and studying about waste speakers. So I recommend it uh, that you, if you are interested in on the topic, those uh, two pieces are very recent and very, very important for the field. And I argue that the bottom up cooperatives um, created by waste speakers are crucial tools to help waste speakers organize and mobilize to fight uh, and resist uh, daily episodes of chronic uh, workplace violence and structural violence. So let's start uh, with a broad vision of the field. So first I want you to define catadores. So, and to discuss about catadores, we need to define what is waste. And waste is all discarded materials that still have some value that could be reused. So, um, instead of like just throwing them on landfills and dumps, we should recycle them and use until they have no value anymore. In Brazil, we have more than 400,000 catadores. We have an estimate of more than 20 million catadores in the global south. And in Sao Paulo, we have around 20,000 catadores. And to talk about catadores, uh, we 
two main con concepts that we need to use. It's about their livelihood and everyday emergencies and what that means. Um, livelihood, it's, it's a concept that deals with the activities that you do daily to make a living. And this, this, this uh, concept is important uh, because we need to define what is work. And this discussion on what is work started with feminist movements in the 80s and 90s, uh, where they start discussing like, work is not only your wage activities that you do in a work day. Like work is everything you do to make a living. So this started with feminist movements because they start discussing motherhood activities and housekeeping activities that was not considered work, but affected a lot of lives, of their lives, and should be considered in any poli poli uh, policies that are targeted to uh, mothers, to housekeepers, to workers. So they need to consider not only the activities that you do during your working day, like, but also the other activities around that allows you to make a living. And this is important for Catadores because as they are a precarious uh, category, like in a very precarious uh, social and economical um, position, they suffer a lot of everyday emergencies. So they usually live in settlements. So their houses are usually affected by floods, by fire, or like health emergencies that they need to attend because they don't have someone to help them with a sick uh, person at home, or like they don't have good uh, access to healthcare. So they need to take care of each other uh, more constantly. So this takes a lot of time from them. And as they work like collecting and selling what they collect, time is very, very important for them. So they need flexibility. Mm -hmm. So when they have an emergency um, and they can't work, um, they, they need to be allowed not to work on that day, but they also need to, uh, to be allowed to work more on the other days, to sell more materials and cover the expenses that come from those emergencies. So that's why when we talk about catadores, we can't just think on them, like on them collecting waste. Like we need to think of the whole uh, perspective of their life in, in a more holistic view when we're discussing policies that affect Catador. Then um, cooperatives and associations. I won't discuss here the difference between cooperatives and associations with a small technical legal difference um, in Brazil civil code. But one uh, perspective that I want to discuss here is top down versus bottom up. Um, Borough uh, cooperatives are the ones created by categories when they organize themselves and create this organization. And top down cooperatives are the ones created by state or parastatal uh, organizations. When they are implementing policies uh, for waste speakers, they usually try to create some kind of cooperative to put the categories there. And, and um, so they create these organizations. So why it's important? Because uh, Rosaldo presents this very well on his work. You can have like completely different uh, results when you have bottom-up cooperatives and top-down cooperatives. Um, just an example, um, in Rio, uh, one uh, bottom-up uh, cooperative that was created uh, at the same time of a uh, top-down cooperative uh, in, in, in Rio, in Jardim Gramacho, um, like the bottom up uh, cooperative today, it's one of the biggest ones. It was created in the 1990s. Um, it's one of the major ones in Brazil and one of the most important ones on so um, waste speaker movement. And the top down cooperative that was created for the cooperatives has failed and uh, okay it was not able to attract catadores. And why is that? Because 
usually the top-down cooperatives created does not uh, consider the, uh, the livelihood uh, and the everyday emergencies of uh, catadores. And they, as they do not talk to catadores to create those cooperatives, they have no idea on, on, on how much uh, income those catadores make uh, uh, monthly or, and, and um, how they work. So in Brazil, we have, uh, I'll, I'll discuss this more uh, on uh, later, we have a very strict uh, labor legislation. And when uh, the state creates top-down cooperatives, they usually try to, to, to impose the restrictions of the labor laws uh, to catadores, and they cannot adapt. So they usually, if they accept the offer to work on a top-down cooperative, they usually leave very quickly. Okay. And also, um, we, are, we always think on, on catadores as like uh, working, uh, uh, collecting waste as uh, uh, less, um, a less resource uh, uh, strategy. And they, way, they make too few money. So usually when, when uh, this, uh, the state's organization create cooperatives, they usually offer like the minimum wage. But catadores, when they work on, on bottle up cooperatives or even like on the streets, they make more than the minimum wage. So usually these top down cooperatives does not work for them and only attracts unemployed uh, people from other uh, worker categories that are already used to the labor laws, to the labor restrictions. So it's, it's a very important distinction between bottom up and top down here. And I will just present uh, a bit of the, the history of the, the fight for the rights, uh, with speaker's right. And here I need to talk about PT, the Works Party, um, the Catholic Church, and the bottom up uh, membership based organizations, which are the cooperatives and associations. And why the PT and the Catholic Church is so important? Um, I've interviewed people from six different cooperatives and associations, and three of them were created with the support of the Catholic Church. And why is that? Uh, in Brazil, we had um, a military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985. It was a military uh, dictatorship. And uh, there was a lot of repression of any type of assembly um, or, uh, or type, any type of civil society organization. Uh, so um, way speakers and any other kind of uh, work, worker was not allowed to, to make assemblies. And the unions were hijacked by the government and were controlled by the government. So, in the same in, in that same time period, the church uh, started noticing that they were losing confidence from the poor population and from um, um, yeah they, they they were losing confidence of the poor and the, they were losing followers to other uh, uh, religions in Brazil, especially the evangelical church and uh, Afro descendant. Uh, uh, religions. So they start, they, they review the way of, of doing religion, of what was the, their, their um, path to salvation. So how to, uh, how, how, we sh how the church should start visioning the world to help um, gain, regaining confidence from the poor. So they implemented the liberation theology it's based on a Marxist uh, perspective um, in which they, 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 the church decided to change the way they act instead of like a passive uh, uh, institution that just teach people how to be saved. They, they should start helping the poor uh, 
to organize, to fight the oppression from the capitalist organizations. So that's why it's called liberation theory. So it's to allow poor people to be liberated from this oppression. So they start doing active work on, on organizing the poor to fight the structures of the state. And in Brazil specifically, they, as, as a, a religion institution, very traditional and very strong in Brazil. Brazil is still a Catholic country uh, and in which the Catholic church has a lot of uh, influence. Um, the state did not repress assemblies inside the church. So uh, people from like sort of all sorts of workers categories started to make assemblies inside the church with the help of the church and create, it started creating organizations. So that's where PT uh, 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 comes, where uh, like, as the, the, the unions were hijacked by the government, worker, workers started to create parallel unions, informal unions with the help of the church. And this informal unions and this movement uh, it's known as new syndicalism. So um, the church was uh, fundamental to help uh, workers uh, to organize and create the PT party. And also with this work, uh, a group of nuns helped uh, eight way speakers that working, uh, was working on the streets to organize and create the first cooperative in Brazil. In, in the late 1980s, uh, which is called Copa Mari, uh, and which is also one of the most important uh, cooperatives in Brazil, um, uh, way speakers cooperatives. Um, and why I'm saying all of this, this connection of the, the Catholic Church with PT and with way speakers is extremely important for the fight for the rights. Um, the dictatorship uh, ended in 1985, and in 1988, we have uh, a new constitution, and we have uh, municipal elections for the first time after more than 30 years. And in Sao Paulo, um, Luiz Erangina, which is from the PT, won uh, the, the elections and became the mayor of, of, the, of Sao Paulo. And she had already, uh, already worked with the same group of nuns um, in another project. So those nuns had, had the contacts with the way speakers from Copamari and with uh, Luisa Longina. And so the, 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 those nuns made the connection and helped uh, the, the, this first uh, cooperative to, to to uh, negotiate with the, the, the municipal government and the municipal government gave them a space to work, tools, a truck. So the, this help from the municipal government at the beginning was, was very important and happened because of this history from the Catholic Church and the PT. Um, this successful uh, um, case of Copa Mari sparkled the creation of other organizations in, in Brazil. Um, another uh, case that, went, that came right, uh, right after the case of Sao Paulo, it's in Belo Horizonte, my hometown, uh, where they created Asmari. Um, and we also had a PT mayor uh, called Patro Zanarias, and he always also start discussing uh, with uh, Asmari to, to, to check how to help them to, to, to work and, and to, to grow. So, um, uh, so uh, Asmari is also uh, another very important cooperative today. And, and in Belo Horizonte, in, in Belo Horizonte, it also happened in, during the 90s 
the first national uh, encounter of, of cooperatives, of way speakers. Um, and, and, um, and it's where it started the national movement and, and where they founded the, the MNSCR, which is the um, Movimento Nacional dos Catadores. Uh, the national movement of waste speakers, uh, all because of these connections between cooperatives and the PT. And with that, uh, in 2001, they, they made uh, a march to Brasilia, which is the federal capital in Brazil, and to show their strength, they, they gathered almost 2,000 waste speakers in Brasilia. All, all of this with the help of the Catholic Church, and they wrote a letter with a several demands um, uh, that uh, that they made to the federal government to help them to to consolidate uh, the work of cooperatives. And in 2002, they were rec recognized as workers. It, it became a formal category uh, in our uh, labor law. And in 2003. Lula, uh, President uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva from PT, won the federal election and started the, the movement that created the national law on, on waste management that, that gave uh, waste speakers a lot of rights that were on the ladder uh, created in 2001. So, the main gains and the main advances in, in Catadores' agenda happen through PT administrations. I brought here a photo of uh, one of the cooperatives that I work with. Um, you can see that they work under a vehicle. It's, it's, a, it's an informal settlement. They, are, they have the registration of the cooperative but they cannot get all the, the registration uh, documents because they cannot get you know, like the, the license from the fire department because it's, it's in an uh, informal settlement. Here is the, the cart that they usually use to collect waste on the streets. So it's pushed by the waste pickers themselves and that's one of the reasons why they usually call when, like, when people harass them, they usually call horses or donkeys because they are uh, uh, pushing wagons. Um, this is another cooperative. It's a way more organized one. They, they work on a shed. Um, they have all the, the license from all, uh, and state institutions like fire department, like environmental department, because they have all, all that it's needed. And I just want to, I, I just brought these two distinct uh, pictures because I want to show like, I was discussing with Christian here uh, uh, before the seminar, like waste pickers covers from people working on the dumps, like collecting on dumps, to people working on cooperatives that are highly organized and 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 like big because they have considering to to uh, chronicle workplace violence violence and structural violence they suffer the, the almost the same time of type of violence like the, the, they have the same issues. They 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 struggle. They have similar struggles. So, um, waste speakers covers this whole uh, spectrum of workers that work with waste. And I uh, I said on my argument that there is no. Uh, um, there's no studies or no um, um, arguments uh, on how waste pickers resist violence. 
and I'm talking so far on how they were able to advance their agenda and, and get rights from the government. So what makes my research different from this social movement perspective that we know that exists since the 1960s and like resource mobilization. The difference uh, of my research is on the concept of everyday resistance. Instead of check uh, of seeing this movement on, on, on this social movement lenses that it's very broad and look for the goals of the movements of way speakers, I want to know how these cooperatives help them to survive in a daily basis. How these cooperatives help them put food on the table. And, and that is the novelty of my research. Uh, and that is what we still need a lot of research. We are starting to have more research on, on, on informal forms of resistance. We already have on housekeepers, uh, that was made by Professor Maie, which is my supervisor. We already have on rickshaw drivers in Colombia, and I'm making it on, on way speakers. So my main concepts are uh, civil society organizations. Um, civil society organization, because uh, we need to define what a civil society is. Civil society is composed by three main uh, institutions, which are the state, the private sector and the civil society, which are not the, the state and not uh, the private sector, which are the citizens uh, and organizations created freely by the citizens. And it's important here because top-down cooperatives um, created by the state cannot be considered civil society organizations because they are created by the state. So my focus is on bottom-up cooperatives, like cooperatives that were created by uh, way speakers, um, because those organizations can be considered uh, civil, uh, civil society organizations because they were created freely by way speakers. Uh, the concept of formalization, um, here it's a more practical uh, uh, discussion on, on formality, because we, we, we now have a broad discussion on what is formal, what is informal, how can we define activities, because people that work on formal environments also make informal activities during their day. But um, I'm not discussing that here. Uh, I, I'm just discussing uh, the formalization of the organizations, like formalizing the cooperative or not and formalization of the work relations. Um, if you formalize the contract that you do with your employer or not. And why is that important? Uh, as I said before, in Brazil, we have a very strict uh, labor law. So when uh, firms try to, uh, to formalize the work relations, way speakers uh, usually can't because that would be too strict for them. Um, one example is you need to work uh, eight hours per day. You can't work less or more. You are not allowed to work more than 44 hours per week. Um, you have to earn your uh, salary monthly. And this does not work for waste speakers. They need the money right away. So usually what they do is that they formalize the cooperative as a cooperative. And I'll explain that more why they formalize as a cooperative. But the formalization of the work relations does not follow the labor laws. Um, I also bring the, the, the concept of violence because we, you, we usually when we think about uh, violence, we think about direct violence, physical violence, and at max, like harassment and, 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 um, uh, and name calling, but uh, violence is more than that. Um, I use the concept of violence uh, that um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, 
it's the difference of what you do and what you could do if there was not an, a violent environment uh, around you. Um, and, and that's where structural violence uh, comes in because structural violence, in the, it's an indirect form of violence. So it's not a violence like uh, done through physical or name calling or anything like that. It's that violence uh, uh, created by uh, policies that restrict your way to work, your way to live, um, demonstrations of force by uh, uh, state or any organization to, to, to make you feel fear and not do what you want to do due to the fear that they create. So all of this uh, uh, enters in this, this broader concept of structural violence. And chronic workplace violence is the, uh, it's the, the, the type of violence that you suffer on your daily basis when you, while you were working, so you on your workplaces. So I con uh, uh, I'm considering, um, I'm using three categories of violence uh, um, uh, mentioned by Professor Maillet, which are financial, when you don't compensate fairly uh, the work that someone do for you, psychological violence, which is harassment, and um, name calling, prejudice, and physical violence, of course. And the concept of everyday resistance also comes from Professor Maier, which is individual co and collectives, sometimes overt but often hidden strategies to, taken by uh, marginalized people to fight these daily sources of violence. So uh, it's, a, it's a new perspective. It, 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 uh, uh, this, this perspective began with Scott in 1985. Uh, he was uh, studying uh, people that collect rice, and he started uh, looking how they they deal with with uh, their employers, um, because different from the Marxist perspective that um, the poor are alienated uh, of the violence that they suffer, Scott show that they are not alienated. They know the violence and the structures and the institutions that are in place, but they use their knowledge to, to, to resist the violence. So when, when their employers on, on the rice uh, farms do not compensate them well, they steal uh, a portion of the rice that they collect to, 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 to make their compensation more fair. So this is like, uh, this is just one small example. He gives a lot of other examples. And he focused on this individual perspective, how each individual fights these structures of violence. Bayat, which worked, uh, builds on the work of, of Scott, um, amplifies this, this concept and start discussing how people can also use these everyday resistance strategies uh, in a collective way. So um, how they do these small um, uh, actions to, to, to fight uh, violence, uh, but also in a collective perspective. And Professor Maie built this concept of everyday resistance based on both Scott and Maie uh, and, and Baya and create a, a, an even broader uh, 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 concept of everyday resistance that um, I've already took. So how, how I'm doing my research, I, do, I did uh, online. Uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, I was not able to be in Sao Paulo. So I had to do it online through Zoom mainly same structured interviews. Uh, and I also gather information on, on social media like uh, Instagram, um, WhatsApp, and Facebook uh, posts made by the cooperatives. I use the snowball sampling. Um, as I was not able to, to be in Sao Paulo, 
I was not able to actively, actively find way speakers. So I, I had to, uh, uh, Professor Maie uh, already had a previous contact with one person in one cooperative uh, in Sao Paulo, which was my first point of contact. And I asked her to start, uh, give me references to refer me to other uh, way speakers. Um, to, in order to be able to interview more people. Uh, I know my, my research is not generalizable um, because it's, it's my main focus, not quantitative, it's, it's, it's exclusively uh, qualitative. It's a, uh, a small case in Sao Paulo, but um, even though it's not generalizable, uh, the theoretical gains can be used to study uh, uh, way speakers in other uh, countries and other cities also. So my main findings uh, so far, um, I divided my findings on, on violence perpetrated by the civil society by the, uh, themselves, uh, the private sectors, uh, the buyers of the recycled materials and the violence perpetrated by the state through policies that punishes waste speakers. So when dealing with civil society, um, the main form of violence was harassment on the streets, which is named calling, as I, as I told at, at the beginning, like calling them horses, calling them uh, um, donkeys, calling them maloqueros, which means petty thieves, uh, as they were stealing the, the waste, not collecting. And what I found that people on cooperatives does not suffer this kind of uh, violence anymore. Um, and people working on the streets still suffer this type of violence. So why is that? Um, in Brazil, since the um, 1940s, when the labor legislation was created, there was an effort from the government that to, 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 to connect the concept of citizenship with work. So you were only deserve, a deserving person if you work and if you have like a formal labor contract. If you, if you do not work in, with a formal contract, you are not deserving. So you do not have access to rights. You don't have, you, don't, you do not have access to, 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 um, to, to the health system. You, so this, this is a very uh, deep cultural thing in Brazil. Like you are only deserved if you work for a company. And, and so when way speakers are working on the street, they are usually not considered workers, even if there is a, a, a red, uh, like a formal category of worker now, when they are not associated with um, cooperatives, they are not usually considered workers. So organizing in cooperatives uh, make the civil society see them as workers. Usually they work on uniforms. Um, they have a, a kind of like identification so people start seeing them as workers, uh, not as like just petty thieves. Also, they started, um, uh, they, they used another uh, category that I, I'm calling here reframing, which is to reorient the society, how, how the society viewed them. So they started giving uh, lectures on universities, on schools, on, on companies uh, to show the importance of their work, to show that they are workers, and to show that like they're not just making a living, like just collecting ways to, to, to get money, but they also are helping the, the, the environment. So they're, they're calling themselves uh, nowadays more uh, more as environmental agents than way speakers. They use, they always use like, I'm an, an environmental agent. I'm not just a way speaker because I, I help the environment. I help the world to survive, to be more sustainable. 
because all this this waste that I collect would be thrown on a landfill and would uh, and would demand like more extraction of raw materials. So I'm important, and you should see me as an important person. And this reframing also helps them to connect to the uh, environment uh, movement, which is a huge movement. So it, it helped them uh, get more uh, negotiation power, more enforcement to their demands. When dealing with buyers of recycled materials, we have three main types of buyers, which are ferro values, intermediates, and the industry. Ferro values are small, small, very small uh, uh, companies that buy any kind of materials. Um, intermediates are the ones that buy materials to sell to the industry. And the industry are the main big uh, companies that usually produces uh, um, materials, like produces plastic, produces paper. So they, they, they buy the material to, to reuse. Uh, to produce new products instead of buying raw materials. And Pelos values are the ones that pay the lowest rates for the catadores. The intermediaries pay a, a, an intermediary fare uh, for the, the, the waste pickers, and the industry is the one that pays the fare uh, fair for, for the waste. Um, Pejos values exist and still are able to buy uh, materials from raised speakers because they pay in cash, they pay right away. So when waste speakers need the money for an emergency, they go to the Pejos values and the Pejos values uh, take advantage of, of this precarious situation of waste speakers to pay the lowest fare and have them the most revenues resetting this, these materials to intermediaries or to the industry. Uh, intermediaries, their work is to buy and resell, so they need to, to pay less than the market price uh, to be able to make a revenue, but it's still a form of violence because uh, waste pickers' uh, wage, it's, it's, it's extremely low. They, the, 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 the average uh, a monthly payment for for a uh, uh, waste picker it's half of the of the formal uh, workers in Sao Paulo uh, so any cent that you take off of their fare means less food on, on their table and and uh, and puts them on a more precar precarious situation and the industry pays the fair amount the, the market price but they demand very specific standards for the trash. The trash needs to be extremely well separated and packed on, on, on cubes that have all the same size. Uh, and this is, it's, it's very costly and you need uh, specialized uh, machinery to do that. So waste pickers uh, in small cooperatives and waste pickers that are not associated with cooperatives does not have uh, money to buy the machinery and are not able to sell to the industry. So what they are doing, they are organizing in cooperatives in order to have to gather more material uh, to avoid selling to ferro values. So they don't want to sell to ferro values at all. And with this amount of materials, they are. Uh, they, they are able to sell to intermediaries or to the industry. The small cooperatives cannot sell to the industry because they do not have uh, the, the machinery necessary, but the, the bigger uh, cooperatives as the one that I showed on the picture that works in the shed, that it's more organized, they, they are, they are, uh, and they are able to sell to the industry. And that comes to their second strategy which is mobilizing the, those bottom-up cooperatives in, in networks to gather even more materials. So for example, that, that 
cooperative that works on a shed that, how, that has all the, the, the machinery. They work with smaller cooperatives like the one that I show in the video to gather materials. So they process the materials for those small cooperatives, gather and, and gather their material to be allowed to sell to the industry for the fair price. And they give the, the, the they share the amount of money that they got from the, the from, from selling to the industry. Another uh, source of income that is important here um, it's because one of the, the, the led, uh, on the national uh, legislation on waste picking that you have in Brazil, um, we have one, one policy that is called Logística Revesa, uh, reverse logi logistics, in which uh, companies that produce uh, recyclable material like plastic and paper, they are responsible for re uh, recollecting that, uh, recollecting and recycling the, the, the materials that they create. And they can do that by themselves or they can hire uh, organizations to do that. But in order to, to access this policy, you need to be fully formalized. You need to have all the license, all the papers. Uh, so small cooperatives like the one that works on the, under the big that cannot access this policy because they do not have all the license. But the one that works on the shed Yes, they can access the, the, uh, the uh, policy. And this, this payment from the industry to, to recollect, the, the, uh, to recollect the, the, the waste that they produce, it's uh, uh, an additional source of income. So when they gather their material and sell to the industry through this policy, they, they are able to make even more money in the market price of, uh, of the, the waste. So they also pass this extra, this additional revenue to the smaller cooperatives and to uh, waste pickers that are not uh, connected to any uh, cooperative. Um, they, they pass this money through. So mobilizing in these networks of cooperatives, it, it's allowing uh, even uh, the smaller cooperatives to access policies that they won't be by themselves and it's helping them to get more money by uh, the trash that they are selling. And the last one is the violence uh, from the state. We have four main forms of violence that it's uh, performed by the state with eviction and repossession, repossession of property. So um, administrations, especially when we have right side administrations try to and uh, try to 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 take out these uh, informal uh, cooperatives or like these bottom up cooperatives to focus on top down cooperatives with policies that like hurt um, uh, the bottom up cooperatives implementation of incineration plants which are policies that allows uh, incineration plants to be installed and incinerate the trash in, to generate energy instead of collecting it and recycling it. Police violence and exploitation. And why exploitation? Because um, collect waste is uh, a municipal government uh, responsibility. So when, when uh, waste pickers collect this trash and help the, 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 the municipal government to save money by like uh, not making the landfills fill too fast and like cleaning the streets and they are not uh, compensated for their work, they're being exploited by the state. So as they are making what the state should do, they, they, they should be compensated for their work. Just an example, in Sao Paulo, uh, less than 40% of the households are covered by selective collection. So 60% of the waste uh, produced, it's collected by uh, waste pickers. So the most part of the waste, uh, it's collected by waste pickers and they are not compensated at any form uh, 
by the, the managers for work. So first, working in cooperatives and associations, and I said that uh, about the working laws, the labor registry, uh, the labor uh, laws. So just the fact that they, they, they organize in cooperatives instead of formal enterprises, it's a form of, re of resistance. Uh, they, they would save money if they formalized as um, an enterprise, they would pay less social taxes. But as the, if they, 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 they formalize as, as enterprises, as companies, they would be forced to, to use uh, the labor law formal contract and would impose those restrictions uh, to waste pickers. So they prefer to organize in, as a cooperative and pay more in social taxes, just to be able to be more flexible with their uh, members. So this is itself a form of resistance. Uh, and the other three forms are organizing, negotiation, and mobilization. Organizing, once again, gives them uh, negotiation power uh, to discuss with the government on, on policies that will help them on their daily basis and help them um, access uh, institutions that they wouldn't be able to uh, through uh, like individual uh, demands. So when they are negotiating, when they are negotiating with uh, the government, the municipal government, they usually use the help from Ministerio Público and Defensoria Pública, which are um, um, public um, lawyers that that are uh, that are uh, yeah public attorneys that that are paid by the state. Uh, that uh, those institutions were created like to, to protect individual uh, and collective rights for marginalized and people that does not have access uh, to, to, to like private attorneys. So they always resort on the Ministerio Público and Defensoria Pública when they are negotiating with the state and they wouldn't be allowed to, to access these both institutions in an individual case. So being in a cooperative, being working in an organized form, like in an organized institution, help them access these this two um, institutions and help them intermediate the negotiations with the government. And mobilization, um, this mobilization strategy was more focused on demonstrations against the incineration plans, uh, uh, policies that were being implemented in cities around Sao Paulo. But this uh, mobilization uh, to, to make demonstrations, it's not being effective. The, 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 the municipal government uh, from these other cities in Sao Paulo are being able to implant, the, the, to approve these policies and implement incineration plants. So now they're trying to, to change their, their strategies and to, to, um, to bring the civil society with them to fight this, this, uh, this policies because it's not, it's not only, a, um, it's not only prejudicial for the waste speakers, but for the whole society, because like in, in incinerate the, the, the waste, it creates a lot of hazard uh, uh, materials like that came from burning the, the waste. Um, it emits like pollutants in the, the air and, and um, so yeah, it, it's very, it, it, it's a very bad, uh, um, solution and with all of that and also take out income from waste pickers because restricts their access uh, to waste. Uh, the negotiation has been successful. Um, I've heard uh, at least three cases in which they were able to negotiate not to be evicted 
or at least if they're being evicted from where they work, they are put in another place, not like just throw on the streets like you can't work here. So we don't care where you're gonna work. So they, with the help of the Ministry of Public and the Ministry of Public, they are being able to to uh, to be reallocated in, instead of just uh, evict. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. So before we go to the question area, we will have Manuel Rosaldo. Uh, can you just uh, put uh, the maybe one? Maybe you can pin him instead of us now. Uh, it's the fourth one. I've been on replacement. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, you just oh, have to okay. stop sharing, yes. Hi, folks. Um, should I should I begin? Yes. 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 All right. Um, well, uh, thank you for uh, that that wonderful presentation, uh, Gustavo and. Uh, parabéns on a, um, a, a really uh, um, a, a huge uh, theoretical and, and uh, empirical contribution that you've made uh, with this thesis. I, I very much enjoyed reading uh, the, I guess, near complete version. Um, and, uh, and yes, thanks again for the, the invitation to, uh, to be here. I, I first uh, met Gustavo, I think, in, in 2019 at the uh, Aragol uh, conference um, at Concordia. I wish I could be there today, despite it probably being warmer here in Pennsylvania than it is uh, there in Montreal. Um, and I, I do want to make sure that there's time for questions, so I'll try to move through this quickly. Um, but uh, I think in this investigation of the strategies that bottom up uh, cooperatives of catadores use uh, to resist violence, um, there, there are a lot of impressive uh, contributions. I also want to uh, note how impressive it is uh, that Gustavo was able to do this uh, during COVID and how, how resourceful uh, he was in researching a, a difficult to re uh, a research subject that's that's difficult to, to research and gain access to uh, during uh, during normal times, but but um, you know much more so during the pandemic and and uh, and I do hope uh, that that uh, uh, as travel uh, becomes safer, that uh, that that Gustavo is able to. Uh, conduct field work in, in Sao Paulo uh, as well. So I want to highlight um, three of the many contributions here uh, and, uh, and raise some questions and a, and a couple suggestions. Uh, one of them is about uh, how uh, Gustavo diagnoses the source of the waste pickers uh, vulnerability. Uh, and the second one is is how he he analyzes their resistance, and then the third one is about how he distinguishes between efficacious and and less efficacious uh, approaches to resistance. And so, first, in terms of the diagnosis of the problem, um, I think that uh, a major contribution here is uh, is analyzing waste pickers' uh, precarity through. Uh, Johan uh, Galtung's concept of, of violence, uh, which, you know, as, as we heard in the presentation, goes beyond uh, direct physical intentional attacks from identifiable uh, perpetrators uh, to uh, less visible forms of violence, such as psychological violence uh, and structural violence. Um, and um, and then, and then drawing on uh, Jean Francois Meyer's work, uh, connecting uh, this this chronic structural uh, violence to the workplace, 
And so um, I'm, I'm not an, uh, an expert in, in Galtung's work, uh, but I, I did find uh, this, this uh, analysis very resonant and productive. And I was trying to think about, you know, um, I, I am a, uh, a scholar of, of, of work and worker movements and, and, and what, what contribution uh, does this framework of violence uh, make to understanding workplace vulnerability or worker vul vulnerability um, as compared to, say, a more traditional Marxist analysis of exploitation? And two ideas occur, occur to me, and one is uh, the, 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 the nature, the, the notion of structural violence uh, and that the, the vulnerability uh, that waste pickers uh, face uh, does, does not, you know, always have to be a consequence of direct and, and intentional attacks. Um, and, and even, it doesn't even have to be uh, a consequence of passive violence in a sense or passive uh, forms of aggression. Um, but, but Gustavo shows us how, how even well-intentioned acts, uh, formalization, which you might assume uh, would benefit waste pickers, uh, can also uh, become a, a form of violence, especially when it's done in a, in a top-down fashion. So um, I found that uh, very compelling. Um, and another contribution, I think, of this violence uh, framework uh, is that uh, I think it can easily be, be applied to systems of domination that go beyond class-based oppression. Um, and especially, I'm not quite sure where conversations are at in Canada right now, but in the U.S., uh, everybody is, is talking about uh, structural racism. Uh, and and uh, people in Florida, in particular, they're 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 getting like really paranoid about it and banning even math test textbooks because they think everything is critical race theory. Um, but uh, but I think that one one uh, one thing about the violence framework and taking it to the workplace is that it can be used uh, to analyze structures of of economic exploitation. Um, but also systemic racism and sexism. Um, and, and I think uh, in particular in, in regards to race, but also uh, to, to gender, uh, that analysis could be fleshed out more in, in your thesis, Gustavo. And so I was, I was curious to, to hear, uh, this was my first question, what, what roles do you think race and gender play in chronic workplace violence faced by waste pickers. Um, and I'm going to keep going, though. I've got a couple couple more questions, um, but also, also we should take questions from other folks. But the second contribution is, is ways in which the waste pickers uh, resist this violence. Uh, and, uh, and Gustavo takes, takes the lens uh, of, of everyday acts of, of resistance. I was interested in Ex this, this expansion of ev everyday acts of resistance to include um, uh, not only the, the covert and, and individual uh, forms of resistance, but also collective ones. And I guess here I want to play uh, devil's advocate a bit and ask, you know, if you, if you are thinking of this as an issue of a vulnerability that, that's created largely through systems of capitalist exploitation uh, of the waste pickers, and you've got big firms, you know, say Coca-Cola or PepsiCo or Walmart uh, that are, are buying uh, materials uh, that, that are, are sold by intermediaries and fejos velios uh, beneath the intermediaries, uh, but collected by the waste pickers. Is organizing into these cooperatives, where you know, to be honest, many of these cooperatives are paying less than the minimum wage, uh, so it's still uh, and 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 the the working conditions 
are still, you know, there's, as you mentioned, a lot of uh, uh, workplace uh, hazards and, and long hours. So this is not necessarily decent work. And so, so, so somebody might try to flip this on the, the, its head and say, are these cooperatives really a form of resistance to this exploitation? Or are they just uh, kind of uh, a different form of, of subordination? Um, uh, in a different form of, of exploitation that's still pretty brutal. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious to hear about that. Uh, just another little thought on resistance and, and just a little suggestion. A lot of what you said resonated uh, to me uh, with ideas that, that uh, the philosopher Nancy Fraser has talked about in terms of uh, struggles for redistribution, uh, recognition, and representation. And so redistribution in the economic sphere, uh, which you see when waste pickers organize into uh, uh, cooperatives to move up the value chain, or demand remuneration from the state uh, for their uh, environmental service. Recognition in the socio-cultural sphere when, when waste pickers say we're, we're environmental agents and, and not just uh, horses or donkeys. And representation in the political sphere uh, when they're, they're um, trying to claim citizenship rights and a voice in shaping uh, policies that affect their work and lives. Um, so, so, uh, all right. So that's, so that, so I'll move on to the third contribution. We've got the analysis of, of, uh, uh, the, the sources of their, their vulnerability and then ways they resist. And then the third contribution I think is distinguishing between, uh, eff efficacious and non-efficacious forms of resistance, and particularly in this concept of bottom-up uh, uh, cooperatives that tend to be initiated by civil society. Uh, in, in the thesis, you also mentioned that they tend to work with historic waste pickers who've worked previously on the streets. In top-down cooperatives that are more initiated by the state uh, and uh, intend to uh, use, use uh, practices that clash with the needs, uh, logics, and, and capacities of street waste pickers. And I think this is a very valuable distinction, but I would encourage you also, uh, and especially if you do, if you are able to do the field work, uh, to maybe make it a little bit more messy and muddled, because I, I think that, that this, is, this is definitely not a strict uh, dichotomy and, and in practice, you know, you'll probably see elements of both bottom up and, and top down in, in most of uh, the cooperatives. And many of the cooperatives that you're researching are using, or several of them, more of the sorter model uh, that that um, and most of their 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 members uh, have have not worked previously collecting recyclables in the street. So that's just something something to uh, keep in mind. But I still think because I, I still think the distinction between uh, bottom up uh, cooperatives uh, that are really driven. Uh, by uh, by their members in top down ones is useful, and and my question here is that one of the reasons that the state in Sao Paulo that the municipal government began organizing cooperatives uh, was because there were an estimated twenty thousand waste pickers on the street, and they believed that they could uh, you know that they that the civil society cooperatives, the ones that existed were a good idea, um, and they want to take the idea by, to scale by putting the force of the state behind it and kind of rolling it out uh, and, and reaching more of these 20,000 uh, waste pickers. And so you seem kind of to have a blanket critique of cooperatives that are organized by the state, but I'm curious if you think uh, how you would respond to the cr critique that you, you need the state in their building cooperatives if you're ever going to reach the scale 
uh, of need of, uh, of, of the waste pickers. Um, so the, that's, I'll leave it there. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Manuel Rosaldo, for these uh, insightful comments. Yeah. Maybe you want to reply to some of them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. They are very important uh, insights and comments. Um, first one about uh, the other sources of workplace violence, uh, which are gender uh, and structure. Um, I was not able to collect that on, on because of online field. Um, I mainly talked to the heads of the those cooperatives, like the administrative board, the direct board, um, because they used the, the structure that they had at their uh, at the cooperative to talk to me, like computer and, and internet. Um, most of the workers that usually work on the ground. They do not have this. Uh, I even tried, like, as like, try to read those people, but they usually don't have smartphones or access to internet. So I was not able to to reach them. So it was it was not possible to to get perspective. And one thing that I mentioned is that this, uh, especially uh, 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 racism and gender violence. It happens throughout um, marginalized uh, uh, people and like gender throughout the whole society. And I try to focus uh, on on violence related only on the act of way speak. So as I was not able to reach uh, people on the ground, um, I try to keep my focus on 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 violence strictly related to work as a waste picker. On um, the exploitation uh, that happens inside those co cooperatives, I, 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 I'm knowledge about it. I know that it, ha it happens, but once again, as I was not able to reach people on, on the ground, I was not able to, co to collect this, this, um, this source of violence. And also, um, Although they are exploited inside those cooperatives, they are doing better than if they were in the streets. That's that's what I get uh, um, from from what I was able to to research, um, where I, I was able to reach the, the and what I was told by by the people that I interview is like when we work, worked on the streets our situation was even worse than working on cooperatives. Um, I, 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 I will make that clear that I'm not trying to romanticize cooperatives because I know there is a lot of issues with that, but it's, it's the least worse. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a, a way out and the least worse uh, like resistance strategies that they can do right away to to get out of uh, harassment on the streets and 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 exploitation from uh, buyers uh, like fellow buyers. And on the third uh, topic uh, on on bottom up and, and top down, I know that is um, that is like uh, it's it's not a clear cut between one and uh, and the other. Uh, I know that cooperatives will need. Um, uh, um, the support of the state to be able to to reach all those twenty thousand um, uh, waste pickers and and especially uh, even with the help of the state with the top uh, down cooperatives we still have less than ten percent of the waste pickers working on cooperatives. Mm -hmm. The the thing is. Um, as you mentioned on, on, on your research very clearly and on Gutenberg also described uh, greatly, it, it's that way speakers voices were not heard during the creation of this top uh, down cooperatives. Um, the, the, the Marta Suplicy government, which is it's, it's, it's from PT, but it's more a centrist 
and it, it, it's more uh, 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 based on te technocracy. She, she used the more, she heard more than the, the voices of NGOs, of uh, consultants, specialists, and did not give enough voice to way speakers to, to, to help them to create this, those policies. So I can make that more clear on, on my paper, but it's just that, yes, uh, the state needs to support to, to expand uh, uh, the cooperatives and, and to back up them in order to be able to, to improve all way speakers' lives. But this work needs to be done with the way speakers. Her, hearing their problems, hearing about their everyday emergencies, and, and, and building a policy that will be able to, to, to allow way speakers to keep the livelihood, to help them improve without bringing more structural violence, as was the case with the top-down uh, sorter cooperatives implemented uh, during Marta Suplicy's government. So it, it's another form of, of um, structural violence. Uh, brought by this new model that she tried to implement because she didn't listen to the way speakers. So to move on, we need uh, more backup from the government, but from the way speakers perspective, not from the government and technicians perspective. Thank you very much. Great responses. So we have only three minutes left. So maybe someone has uh, some, uh, someone has a question. Go on for uh, like a few minutes. Yeah, yeah we can go like, about uh, it. We started just <laughs> anyway, uh, but I I don't want to dominate. So they are why don't you go? Well, first of all, Manuel, you asked one of my questions, so I was like, damn. But I, I thought about another one while uh, while we were talking, and I guess this also is. Uh, something I'm thinking of uh, as doing research with populations that are marginalized, I guess my question to you is, what is the relationship that you have established with the people that you interviewed? Because there's, for me, when we're doing research on social justice, it's not just like a one shot thing. For me, it's a lifetime engagement with people. It's relations of friendship. It's, you know, like, so my question to you is like, how did you uh, approach the people that you contacted? How long have you been involved with them? What do you see the future of your relationship with them to be like? Do you have any? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's a very good question. That's a great yeah. question. And I'm lucky to be working um, with Brazilians because we are very warm, welcome, and Although, like, uh, bringing the name of Professor Maillet was very important because he's been working with, um, with this specific uh, um, way speaker that was the, my first point of contact. So he already had a relationship, so he presented me to her. And, and she's a very, very kind person. And we chat a lot, like, not, we made because I'm working with her for another project in which we, we recorded some interviews for a video capsule that we're building um, through Eddie Gall and Helen. Um, but uh, so I, 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 um, I, I have a close uh, contact with her because we, we were not only talking through Zoom with the interviews, but we chat a lot through WhatsApp. Um, and, and I also try to build this close relationship with uh, the person, the, with the people that she referred to me. So I, I, I keep talking with them through WhatsApp. The, they know that I'm not there only because of COVID. So they understood that it's not I'm, that I'm not there because I don't want to, but I can. So I, I've received yesterday the invitation because they are creating now a university of way speakers wow. in Sao Paulo, based on the experience of the uh, the landless movement that mm. has a, a the MST has a, a very non university for like uh, at least two decades, 
and now they're creating uh, based on the same model uh, uh, waste pickers university where they 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 want to to teach people how to to collect waste how to recycle how to work with waste and they sent me the invite to be there. It, it will be launched this Saturday. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I won't be able to do it. But so it was interesting and it was good that like Brazilians are open and 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 easygoing. So I was able, even though I was working through the, the through Zoom and I'm far, I was able to create at least like basic relationship with them. And 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 for future research, I, I think I'll be able to go there and and closer the ties. But like for the purpose I, uh, of the research, uh, I think I, I, like it's not it's not enough. I know, but at least um, to collect some data, it was good enough. Um, they told me some stories that I, I wasn't even expecting, like. Um, cried on the camera, like telling their story. So I, I felt that there was a, a, a minimal connection with them, but yeah, it's not ideal. It's not ideal at all. I was expecting to do ethnographer work to stay there like three months, six months, mm -hmm. but with COVID, I, I had to adapt. And it's at, and as it is a master's, I need to conclude in two or three years. So I, I need to graduate on, on August. So I, 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 that's that's what I was able to do with the COVID situation. That's maybe the beginning. <laughs> I, I'm a glass full type person, you know. So I think you know this is just the groundwork for more, more deepening relationship to flourish, right? And when you arrive, you will have already created these relationships, so you will be able to to have more profound conversations with these people. Yeah, okay. another another way speaker that I thought you uh, uh, send me some audios like happy telling me that he got a, a, a position on the municipal government to work on a committee for way speakers. So he was all glad and, and telling me because I, I'm also a civil servant in Brazil. So I work for the government, uh, for the state government uh, for, for Minas Gerais state government. Um, so I said, no, now we're a colleague because now I'm a civil <laughs> servant also because now I work for the, the municipal government. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they're very kind, very warm and open and like open the doors for me. This, the same guy, like I was interviewing him on WhatsApp and his dad kind of entered the room and like his grandparent was a way speaker, his dad was a way speaker, and now he's a way oh, speaker. Wow. So he presented me to his dad and said, "Oh, uh, hi, this is my dad I, that I told you that he used to work with way speaking." Uh, and he presented me to his dad. It, this is this is an interesting thing that uh, um, there's a paper I can't remember if I had now, but I can send you later. That um, even for the ethnographical work online. Sometimes it's it's better than than in person because people can talk mm -hmm. from their private spaces. So they they open the doors of their houses. Like if uh, if I were present in São Paulo, I would just talk to them in a closed uh, room in inside the cooperative. But like talking through Zoom, I was able to 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 know their family, to to see their houses. They open the doors. Of their houses for me, so it's interesting that, like, in part, it's 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 you have a distance um, because of the distance, but on the other side, you you can be more um, in close connection because they are in a safe space where they can talk to you more openly. Because like when they are on the cooperative, they sometimes they cannot. Talk about some topics because there is there are people around, but when you're zoom zooming with them and they're at their own homes, they're more they are able to to talk more freely. So it was an interesting aspect of doing this online also. Then another question, maybe. Uh, I have a few comments on that. And 
Yeah. And I don't know if the question will have time. To Maybe you it. can just come here so Manuel yeah, will be able to see you a bit. Some <laughs> shadows. Um, no. Oh, it's because the camera is there. He doesn't know, see yeah. you there. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, both doing this research and sharing it with us. And I think it was a very meaningful way to kick off the series because May 1st is approaching. So uh, the, the Labor Day, uh, which is kind of weirdly not Labor Day in the US, but it has a labor history why it's not anyway. Um, so the first I want to say that I really appreciate the connection you made with the with the kind of the Marxist feminist literature on the definition of work, reproductive work, and what is work and what is kind of value. And I think um, there is more than one kind of parallel between that literature and your work in that. So not only in terms of what is the question of what is work and who's a worker, but also kind of the more, maybe not that not only kind of the feminist, but what I would call the eco-feminist literature on, on kind of labor and the question of work and value. They've been, and also kind of the feminists have been underlining the very kind of specific nature of this, of this, of the ecological and socially reproductive work. And it's kind of drawing a parallel between uh, what you mentioned about and what kind of, what Manuel also emphasized about what is particular about this kind of work in Waste Picker's case that makes it fragile and make, makes them their work vulnerable or themselves vulnerable. In a, in a kind of parallel sense, feminists have underlined how the social and ecological reproductive work is uh, temporally and spatial, spatially specific. So like if you're taking care of a kid, you cannot just like feed the kid in the morning like a few times and expect the, the kid not to need it again, right? It's like very embodied and very much driven by the needs of another person. And it could be like the tilling the, the land as well. Like you cannot just, so it's not like factory work, which kind of makes the, the, the practicers of this kind of work very much kind of the work is very much outside of their control it's the, driven by the spatiality and the temporality of other processes which makes them particularly vulnerable so i just wanted to kind of highlight that as another kind of parallel between these uh, these kind of fields of work the two questions i had i mean i had many questions because cooperatives are kind of from a very different perspective from a de perspective of economic democracy is a very much of a of a of my kind of uh like importance and and, and attention for me uh so i have like a bunch of questions about how they formed it what are kind of the how do they make decisions what are like the terms and like we can talk about it like for weeks afterwards. So I don't expect you to kind of speak to that. But like my main question is, uh, so you start by talking about everyday forms of resistance, but then like what you showed us is like very much not everyday forms of resistance, like kind of long-term organizing to like negotiate with the state, long-term organizing to like speak in schools and like reframing their work. So it's not really kind of the, either like the, kind of Jim Scott kind of weapons of the week kind of actions, nor like ad hoc kind of resistances in the workplace. Maybe it's part of, uh, maybe you like your findings so far because it's mostly interviews, not like really everyday observation. But like, I thought your findings were not really everyday resistance. So what is actually everyday resistance among like those findings? I was curious. Uh, and the other, again, kind of more of an intellectual and political curiosity. And since you brought up uh, the 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 landless, I was I was um, wondering if they have any relationships. What kind of relationships they have with other social movements or organizations that are more bottom up in Brazil, for instance, the not only the landless but the homeless, the roofless uh, in the cities, um, but also with other contexts like Argentina. Uh, where the piqueteros had like a lot of organizing, very different context, very different history. I mean, similar context, but like coming out of the more the crisis. Uh, so, are they building like international alliances or, or so? 
uh, any of these questions you would be like speaking to, I'd be happy. Yeah, uh, yeah, to draw this line, especially doing online uh, field work um, on what it's every day and what it's more long lasting forms of resistance, it's hard. Um, my, my, my take on that, it was to differentiate what they do for the movement itself, like TV, mm -hmm. uh, social movement and resource mobilization, perspective that they want, like they, they organize and mobilize towards uh, collective goals of the social movement um, and focus on how they use uh, these tools. And that's why I call cooperatives as just a tool uh, to, to, to achieve goals for themselves um, in, in, the, in, in an everyday basis. Uh, I, I have uh, one case. Uh, one case that I highlight on on on, on my research, it's it's a it's a girl from uh, uh, the suburbs of São Paulo. She tried to waste people on the streets because, like, she would be able to make money to to live, but she was harassed by other waste pickers and by the population, and so she tried to move to another neighborhood, but. She was not able to transport the, the material that she collected to the to to the sellers. Mm -hmm. So um, she she started thinking about it, and she decided to organize ten women, unemployed women, form a a, a, a cooperative, okay. and it started through the cooperative that she formed with uh, with these other ten women. She started negotiating with the waste picker that were harassing her on the streets, and and told told them because she, she used to work on an, on another cooperative, and she stopped uh, because she got a formal position, um, but then due to COVID she lost she lost that position, so she tried to to start collecting uh, on the streets, so but she she couldn't, so. Through the cooperative, she started to negotiate with those waste pickers that harassed her and told them, you, you are selling your, your waste to Ferro Velho that are paying way, way less than you could make if you sell to intermediates and to the industry. I know how to do it. I have the structure. So if you sell your material to me instead of to Ferro Velhos, we can gather that material and sell to intermediaries, so I will make money, and you will make mo mo much more money than, than you're doing uh, nowadays. So she was able to do that. Now she's she's renting another space that it's bigger because she's not being able to 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 store a job with the waste that she's buying anymore. So she's getting bigger, and it was a form that she found to 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 resist the harassment. And so she stopped being harassed. Uh, when she formed the cooperative, she started making money and she started helping uh, uh, waste pickers that were not associated with cooperatives. So it, 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 she started like, um, she did all of this, uh, not in, on the cause of, of the waste pickers movement, but to, to make a living for herself. So that's the, that's the connection that I'm trying to make uh, 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 between the, 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 the everyday form of, mm -hmm. forms of resistance and cooperatives that are long-lasting strategies. So it, it's, it's a way that they are finding to make more money on a daily basis of selling their materials for higher uh, incomes, or for higher revenues, for higher fares. But, and, and I, I try to make this clear uh, on, on, on the thesis, that it, it's it's different, like when you're analyzing the long lasting effects of working on cooperatives that help with all the social movements goals to advance the agendas mm -hmm. of waste pickers. It also helps them make more money on a daily basis okay. and not be harassed because when they are working on the cooperative, they're kind of protected and, and they change the, 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 the way the society sees them as workers and not as petty thieves. So it's a tool that they use to to fight this uh, everyday uh, okay. forms of violence. So uh, I know it's 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 a, a 
difficult distinction and maybe I, I was not that clear during the presentation, but I, I try to be more clear on the thesis. So. All right. no, 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 thank you. Now it's, it's clear for me, I guess, like, I mean, this is a limited, we have limited time and you can only say like a few, like uh, limited things about the research, but um, now I understand better. It might be me, but I also <laughs> had to walk out of for a few minutes, but thank you. It's a it's very, very good. Thank you. I, I, I know we have to leave, but I have just a clarification question because yesterday I, I read your paper, Manuel, and you just said that waste pickers were doing, were making more money um, when they were organizing cooperative. But when I read your paper, Manuel, you were saying actually that uh, they, uh, when they are waste pickers working as individual on the street, they can make, they can make 1.5 to two times what they make when they work in a cooperative. Can you just clarify that point for me? Um, yeah, I think that uh, it would per perhaps it, it depends on what the what the point of reference is. But in the in the paper, uh, I did say I, I think that was uh, th that that street waste pickers there's there's okay for one thing there's there's wide fluctuation between incomes both in cooperatives and among street waste pickers which makes it uh, tricky to do a one-to-one -one comparison but what i uh, argued was that I, I believe that the average income on the street was about 1.5 to two times the minimum wage whereas in the cooperatives it was closer to one minimum wage, um, and uh, but and then in terms of of what your findings were, uh, Gustavo, may, maybe you could uh, elaborate on uh, how how that compares because it could be, uh, for for example, there are cart pusher cooperatives uh, like Coper Glicerio that that uh, where which was one of Gustavo's sites, uh, where those waste pickers are going out to the streets, and and I think they are uh, probably earning higher higher amounts than they would be uh, without without being part of a, a cooperative. But then there's another model of of cooperative that's the sorter model, where the incomes are are lower. Um, so, so a little bit depends which which uh, types of cooperatives uh, are are being compared. Yeah, and that's why I brought the bottom up and top down because the sorter cooperative that pays around the one minimum wage are the top downs created okay. by the municipal government, and th so th that's why I, I talk like they didn't have a clue on how much money waste pickers <laughs> used to make. Yeah. So they offered one minimal wage, thinking that they would improve waste speakers' lives, but <laughs> it was the contrary. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the sorter cooperatives was not able to attract waste speakers, but other unemployed uh, people, because uh, they were offered lower uh, wage than the waste speakers do on, on the streets. And, and bottom-up uh, cooperatives usually are, uh, at Copper Glissetti is one case, in which they are, they're, they're people like going with their cards, collecting and use the structure of the cooperative to sort and sell, mm -hmm. to sort, uh, bundle and sell. So, and, and they have other sources of, of, of income that I talk on the thesis that I was not able to, to, to say here. Through the cooperatives that they have trucks, they, they are able to, to provide other types mm -hmm. of services mm -hmm. to earn more money. So they rent their trucks, they collect, uh, uh, waste from from uh, companies and 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 buildings that uh, need to pay someone to collect their waste okay. in Sao Paulo. Um, they made handcraft things with uh, waste. Sometimes they find watches, jewelry, money on 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 the waste, and they are able to keep it and sell it. And when they're working on sort of cooperatives, uh, it. Uh, this is the case also in Montevideo. Uh, when they are working on top-down cooperatives, they are not allowed to 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 keep those findings. They need to handle to to the administration, and mm -hmm. the administration keeps and sells. 
So it, it's another source of income that they are they, that, deprived. that they are deprived. So um, that's why it's important the distinction between the bottom down mm -hmm. and the top, uh, the, the bottom up and the top cooperatives. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Mona, for joining us and uh, for your very thoughtful comments. It's always um, a pleasure to <laughs> see fellow uh, academics and faculty engage with our fellows' work. So it means a lot. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And Thanks so much for having me. What I will share event. the recording with you by email, okay? Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. You all too. Bye. Bye bye. Oh, we're gonna we have the reservations for lunch. Yeah, I hope you do it.